Welcome to Still Growing in Grace, a program dedicated to inspiring joy, giving hope, and delighting in grace. I'm Mike Zenker, and I'll be sharing with you a message of hope that will expand your understanding of God's love and amazing grace. God already deeply loves you, totally accepts you, and really, really likes you. Growing in Grace Ministries Canada and Hope Fellowship, your community church, invite you to enjoy today's program as we dig deeper into what it means to be still growing in grace. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Still Growing Grace. Thanks for taking time to be with me today. Um, today's going to be a little bit different. It's been a long time since I did a solo conversation on Still Growing in Grace. Um, and I had something kind of hit me this week and made me ponder some more on not just life, but on um, uh, this journey of deconstruction and what it can do to you <laughs> and there's there are ups and downs on the journey and some people are afraid of it some don't like it so today's program has been called deconstruction explored i think it's going to take uh this week and next week um but for part one uh i'm going to talk about the the question is this something you run from or is it worth exploring um there's a lot of folks who really they're not much into exploring faith they they think they have their faith all laid out they they're on a journey of um i know what i believe and that's it that's great um but i found myself over the years pulled and dragged uh in uh exploring a better deeper more hopeful perspective that now that does not mean i have the right perspective it means the one i am enjoying and expanding my understanding in uh, is bringing me great delight and it just gets better and better uh, for others th there's a real tension there's uh, there are people that are uh, imploding um, hitting great depression great anger um, because either they're they're finding out that they've been lied to um, either intentionally or unintentionally which happens in life that's called life um but there are others who are kind of wondering what is this thing and the buzzwords deconstruction i don't like that word much anymore i'm i'm losing great favor of that word um but it's still a word we must address it's still a word that identifies or is a shortcut to a category of discussion that um, either you want to talk about or you don't. So I, I want to unpack it a little bit because I think definitions matter. I really do. Um, if we don't talk through the definitions of anything in life, then we could be talking from two different dictionaries and, not, and, and wonder why we're having a hard time understanding each other. So today I want to I want to look at this deconstruction thing. By the way, I I can see comments. So if you're watching and have a comment or something like that, I can interact a little bit better today than I normally do, because uh, usually I have the the pre-recorded um, interview going, and I can interact then as well. But today I want to I want to share some thoughts because I know we've done this before. We've we've shared what I'm about to share previously. I think only once, but. I think it needs to be repeated a lot. And by the way, I'm going to have coffee while we're doing this thing. I usually I sit and have my coffee during the video. I don't get to, I, I need a coffee. So I'm going to sip away at my coffee and enjoy, uh, while I share with you. And, and, uh, I used to call this grounds and grace, <laughs> but anyway, this is, this is good. Anyway, uh, it's a tough one. This, this, this topic can really, really mess with you and I want to I want to get into this let's, let's just get into the slides here I've got some stuff I want to walk you through all right deconstruction Bill Thrasher likes the term disassembly instead uh, again he's got a number of of labels that are really really good Bill and Richard and I have been talking about deconstruction for the last year or two years now it doesn't just it doesn't sound like the word deconstruction because in my mind, deconstruction is really just basic discipleship, like growing, maturing in faith. That, that's it. So um, what deconstruction 
uh, the term is doing right now is uh, is a blunt call out to say, hey, have you ever questioned your faith before? So there is value to that. And I think people do need to question their faith. I think uh, for me, having grown up in a religious background, I was never allowed to question. And maybe that's the point. We were never allowed to question the answers shoved down our throats. And now it's time to question some of those things because we had this gut feeling at times that that ah, doesn't sit right. I remember in youth group uh, as a kid, you know, uh, um, the, the youth pastor would talk about this topic and I had this thing inside this, ah, that's weird. That's opposite of what you said last week. So anyway, you kind of know the inconsistencies. And so it began a long time ago. And I'm sure all of us uh, understand what that's like. But I like Bill's term, we're just disassembling. But what is it that we disassemble? Probably the things that aren't true anyway. So I think that's really important. Uh, Lisa Couture, she likes the word dismantling, taking out the man, our man-made or human um, and uh, things of... Um, that we've put into what we think faith is. Uh, Jen, you wrote, or being told you don't have enough faith if you question anything. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my goodness. How many times have I been told you don't have enough faith or you need more faith? I've addressed that at Hope Fellowship forever. I just think it's, yeah, it's, mm, that's really a frustrating one. Um, renovation is another one that I like um, instead of deconstruction. Renovation of your faith uh, is is important, and we'll we'll get into that a little later. Authentic discipleship. This is it. I, it's really what this is. Like when you're when you go to let's say Sunday school. Let's just begin there, um, or as a little child. Um, but then you enter into Sunday school. They teach you these really nice things. The the key Bible stories, and it's all like. But then as you get older, now you read the real stuff. Now you realize all the gross, gr grotesque, and horrible incest and murders and all that stuff. And go, what is this? But you weren't told that as a kid. So there's a deconstruction that happens then too. You don't realize this has been going on your whole life. So don't be all shocked at this word deconstruction. And for those that are um, thinking it's evil and a terrible thing to run away from, um, you better sit up and listen. There, there's more going on than you realize. And this is coming from someone who has, I've been a pastor for 33 years now. I've been exposed to a lot of denominations. Uh, I'm not saying I'm right, but listen, you, to, to sit on the sidelines and say it's all wrong and run from it, it's bad. Well, if that's the case, you, well, actually you wouldn't be watching right now. Ha! He just wouldn't. I know it. Um, but you're still going to bump into people that do have these issues. All right, another one. Um, maturing your language and terminology as you grow from stage to stage. And I think that is a really good um, way to express or explain this journey of deconstruction that really uh, the terminology used as a child is not the same thing you're going to use as a young adult, which is not the same terminology you're going to use as a mature adult. And that happens in real life and it happens in spiritual life too. So that's pretty cool. All right. Uh, deconstruction from Bill. I love this. Bill says, the real point is that deconstruction has a connotation towards destroying the supporting building blocks, whereas these other terms seem more intentional about breaking them down in a mindful fashion so that they be rebuilt into something much stronger and more stable. So, which brings me to my first point deconstruction does not mean to destroy all you've learned. This is the greatest misconception about deconstruction. Um, and when some folks get into the role of unlearning and they find these categories and topics, they start taking a sledgehammer to everything in a very, it's probably a natural way, but it's still either, I don't like to use the word immature but some of it really is probably because they should have done this a long time ago and didn't know and it's their journey of freedom so to do this in a safe place is really important 
Yeah, I, I'll get to that at the very end. One of the things I highly recommend, do not deconstruct online on your social media. Do, as in, don't let that be the place you do, you do your processing and venting. That's a horrible idea. Um, it'll just it'll create more anger and it's supposed to be personal. It's It's your journey. And there are many others you can find who are also on the journey um, that you can high five with or have authentic questions with. So anyway, I, that's that's one of my thoughts. So it's not about destroying. It really is not. It can't because it would say destroying faith, but deconstructing is more of a meticulous dismantling. It's realizing or discovering that broken pieces have found their way into your theology and need to be removed and replaced with the original parts, the OEMs. <laughs> Listen, when you get a, um, a car part for your vehicle and you want the original parts, uh, well, the original design number, the part number that's meant for your car for that specific model. When it comes to our faith, we have all these different models, these different denominations, these different histories. We in the West have this westernized Christianity that really... Um, there's a more ancient perspective and perspectives than we've been told about. We seem to think in the West that we have it right and we're here to reach the world because we've attained this revelation of what the true gospel is. And by the way, that's one thing that drives me nuts is when people start to say, I'm telling them the real gospel, the full gospel. Well, you just created a separation and divide and put yourself above someone else. You just did that. I've done it, unfortunately, in other terminology, but but those are real triggers now. Um, uh, just careful. <laughs> That's all I say. Just be careful with your terminology so you don't sound like you know more than the person you're speaking to or you shut the gateway for any meaningful conversation. <laughs> yeah, I've not arrived at that yet. I've not perfected that. All right, deconstruction does not mean throwing out Jesus. Um, some folks will think, well, then uh, uh, what am I going to lose? Am I going to totally walk away from Christianity? Well, you might walk away from the religion, but you may not walk away from the one who holds you together or the source of your faith. Uh, in fact, uh, that may be all you'll be left with. My question will be, or the question will be, which Jesus? Um, I had a good friend of mine go through a major crisis. And when he met with me and we talked through, he says, I don't know what I believe anymore. I, I give up. I don't believe any of this stuff anymore. I said, oh, wait, just Jesus. And from that point on, my friend began to explore, re-explore, ha, 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 uh, who Jesus is. And didn't seem to be the Jesus that was sold on TV. It didn't seem to be the Jesus that was promoted in the system of religion or the system of the religion of Christianity. There seemed to be a more authentic, relational Jesus who you would see in the a Sermon on the Mount. The Jesus that would heal and, and those that really didn't deserve it, who would um, go to a woman who's about to be stoned and protect her, which you just don't do those days. Th this is the Jesus who turned the tables of theology on the religious elites. Huh. So, which Jesus? I had a I had somebody, um, uh, I responded to a comment and misread somebody, unfortunately, uh, when they talked about which Jesus and Unfortunately, I was in an emotional rush and I just did a shortcut and thought they were, you know, kind of dissing Jesus and, and they weren't. And when I got confronted, I felt horrible. So I, I was away from a computer doing some uh, work uh, that had just like home labor and suddenly I had time to think through why was I, rea why did I react that way and how did I get caught hurting somebody, which I hate doing. I really, really do not want to hurt people, especially on the journey of faith. Oh my goodness. And so I realized uh, I didn't take the time in my own stress and anxiety, uh, my shortcuts, 
because I had to get this done, that done, and I had just come off an exhausting weekend and realized, oh my goodness. And I was luckily, oh my goodness, thank God, um, uh, had a conversation with a, via text message or message or whatever with this individual and apologized. And man, they were gracious. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, that's cool. So the safe place to deconstruct, the safe place to screw up, be forgiven, and continue conversation, that's a rare find. It really is. But which Jesus? Um, the Jesus that uh, people use to build their political party? Can I say hell no? No. No. <laughs> um, or the Jesus that controls systems and powers or the, the Jesus that, um, wait, by the way, Jesus doesn't do any of that. All these, okay. The misrepresentations of Jesus ha are what have turned people off. And this, if there's a really cool thing about deconstruction, it is about dismantling those misconceptions and constructs. They need to be torn down. In fact... Uh, when you're doing a full renovation or on a construction site and you're deconstructing, you may have a burn pile. That's right. You may have a burn pile because that stuff is just no good for anything anymore. Uh, th throw in the fire bin, gone, and burn it up. There's Some of those fires are big <laughs> in our theological journey. Uh, I'm certain I have more pieces to throw into my burn pile. <laughs> Thanks, Rod. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, we may have more pieces of our theology to throw in that burn pile than we realize. But if you're not even willing to go visit the site, the construction site, um, and you, you may be in your cozy little theological bubble and wonder, well, you know what? You're okay there. God knows you're there. And only Jesus can pull you out and start to create the hunger for you. Only Jesus can do that. So we actually don't have to push anybody into deconstruction. You don't have to be afraid of deconstruction because if you do start the journey, Jesus is the one leading you and guiding you. He's not going to leave you alone. Man, it's... It's a lot less scary than we, we think. Huh. Deconstruction does not mean you'll become an atheist. A lot of people are afraid that, hey, uh, if, I, if I start this journey, I know many people have become atheists because of it. Well, although atheists are closer to discovering the real trinity than our fundamentalists and staunch religious people, the God they don't believe in, you will discover you don't believe in that God either. So I don't find atheism uh, as a, um, a threat in any way to Christianity. I really don't, or uh, uh, it's hard to use that word correctly, but I identify as, a, as one who believes in Jesus, a follower of, of Christ. The system or the misrepresentation of Christianity, that's a tough one. I, I, I like what Paul Young says, and maybe that's a good way to put it. He says, they're my people. They're, and, then, and again, I come from that world, they're my people. I gotta be careful about not bashing them, even though some of them act like jerks. But I acted like jer a jerk too. Didn't know it. So we need grace there too. And the one who's on the journey of deconstruction, I bet you, will have more grace. That's what's leading you on your journey to begin with. Anyway, I, atheism is is you can, it's not a threat. Um. Deconstruction does not mean you'll become a universalist. Now, to some that I'm friends with, they go, what do you mean? What, why is that a bad word? Well, it's because in the religious world, it's a horrible word. It's like a swear word being a universalist. Uh, even in my town that I'm in right now, um, universalism, if you're being called a universalist, that's like, a, that's like shunning. It's like a banishment term because, first of all, they're, I think most are ignorant very ignorant. Ignorant means not knowing. They don't know what it even means. They have this little tiny bite-sized perspective on what universalism is. And by the way, at the very beginning of this conversation, I said definitions matter. They really matter. 
That's why we have to have these conversations. I think they're really, really important. So universalism, hmm. Although you never have your boundaries pushed, sorry, although you will never have your boundaries pushed on how far God's love and grace really does reach, you will have your boundaries pushed. That's, oops, sorry. It's better that, uh, it is better than you've been told. So if you were to ask somebody who's, who thinks God's love is limited, by the way, that's, that's really what people are saying when they're accusing or using universalism as a derogatory term, they've just labeled themselves as uh, the limited gods people. God has a limit on his love. Sorry. That's like, you don't even know what you sound like. You, you have no clue. And it's almost funny. It, now that I'm talking about with you, because sometimes I process verbally, if you hadn't figured that out yet. <laughs> But uh, this whole idea of universalism, I, I would call them allies and friends. Uh, do I fully understand universalism? No. Um, but I believe God's love is for everyone and everything. God's love and light shines through all humanity, period. Separation is an illusion. Oh, you must be a universalist. Well, what do you mean by that? Because there's so many religious backlash phrases to it. And I think, I, th I don't think we need to be afraid of it. If that's what's preventing you from beginning a journey of deconstruction, revisiting some of these pillars of faith, I think, I, just don't worry about that one. It, God's love is bigger and better than you thought. <laughs> that's all I'll say. Um, this is a biggie. Deconstruction does not mean getting more answers right. Ouch. Oh, and yet that's what we think we're trying to do. We're trying to get the right answers, which is a motive. And we are trying to fat. And I'll use the phrase more hope filled perspectives. But to me, I just think the menu grows. Instead, you will gain more insight and wisdom from more ancient sources. You'll begin to become more comfortable with the mist with mystery rather than absolute cubbyhole theology. We've been groomed in the system of Christianity in the Western church to, to um, value being right and having more knowledge than the person we're talking to. That's not the way of Jesus. Th that is not even his system. But if you were to contemplate long enough, you would come to the realization that many of our arguments are about being right, pointing out someone's wrong because we're right. Um, I'm getting more and more embarrassed about the path I've come from and some of the immature patterns that I've seen. It's, it's just getting, I'm getting tired of that and I don't want to be associated with it but I am, I'm connected. Like Paul Young says, they're my people. So be careful not to create another separation, another dualism in reaction to the other dualism. There, you could miss, you know, uh, fall into the wrong ditch. You're trying to avoid the one ditch and you end up in the other. There's a weird, mysterious wisdom here. I hope you hope you hear it. Deconstruction does not mean what you were taught was all wrong. That that is a natural reaction to those on the journey of deconstruction because we would say, "Well, man, everything I taught was wrong." Okay? That you're right in the middle of the learning part. So, you're not done. So, if that phrase is there, there's much more to go. You're not finished. So, a caution on that because I remember so again at 33 years of being a minister I didn't know I didn't know I was forgiven until seven years in like really forgiven I thought I was forgiven only when I prayed a prayer it was up to me to stay forgiven like that's I'm just giving you one quick example of where my deconstruction journey began like 20 five years ago, 26 years ago. 
it was on the topic of forgiveness, my own forgiveness. From then on, I began to discover what I call grace, where I learned about the old and new covenant. Well, I needed to learn all that. That's very stark contrast to everything else, else I learned. Oh, my goodness. Um, all the, man, what they taught me growing up was wrong. That was my term. I used those phrases. <laughs> and that's not the right conclusion. Instead, you will discover that I was that we were taught incom what we were taught was incomplete and those who taught didn't know really important you catch that anger may rear its ugly head but the deeper you grow and the more compassion and understanding you will have and display wow i love that instead you will discover that it was incomplete so uh, that word incomplete is a really wise way to process uh, or should be part of your vocabulary in the deconstruction journey because it's it's not a term that causes division it creates an open hand it, it's like saying hey I uh, instead of saying I know what I believe and that's it to open hand okay maybe I need to pull out or put in whatever needs to be put in or taken out so again our, our time's up I only want to do a half hour at a time right now, but this this whole deconstruction journey we don't need to be afraid of. And so next week I'm going to continue and talk about a couple more things, uh, removing some of the fears or misconceptions of deconstruction, um, and then some wisdom on okay, what are some pointers of uh, along the way of what we should do or. or Anyway, you'll, you'll understand when I get to it. it. It's good. And for me, it's really good to revisit all this. And uh, the event I was talking about earlier triggered triggered today's conversation because um, I needed to be reminded of some things and slow down for Pete's sake um, because people matter and Jesus slowed down for people. He didn't rush things. Here, here's a great example. I love this story. Uh, Jesus shows up late for Lazarus's funeral, and he gets there. They're weeping by the tomb. He's been dead for four days. He knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, but he does something bizarre. Here's the Son of God, knowing full well what he's about to do. Let me tell you what he didn't do. This will make this will make more sense. Jesus did not go. Ugh. You people who are weeping and they're really upset that Lazarus is gone. This is four days later. He did not say, oh, you people, I got this. I'm, hey, I'm going to heal him. It's okay. God, it. hey, you can stop your crying now. Watch. Hey, sit back. Watch this. He didn't do that. What did he do? Jesus wept. I've had to think through this one a lot. And I do a lot of funerals, so I get to think about this more often than most people. But... Jesus wept, being fully God and fully human. He did not live out of his divinity. He lived out of his humanity, making him having to be dependent on his Heavenly Father the whole time. And in that moment, people around him were weeping. So he didn't hurry the process. That's the lesson. He engaged in it. When we see people frustrated with faith, we shouldn't rush their process. We need to pause and engage and sit with them. Wow. That was powerful. Holy smokes. <laughs> oh, man. It's just hitting me. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Ah! <laughs> anyway, I better stop. Um, next week, we'll come back and... Uh, We'll uh, we'll do part two, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, it's a continuation of this. So, if anyway, if you like this, share it with somebody else who needs to hear some good news right now. And um, it's the first candid conversation I've had with you guys for a long time on Still Growing Grace. So I'm glad I'm glad I did it. And we will catch you guys next time. Until then, uh, have a fantastic week, and we'll see you next week. Join me next time on Still Growing in Grace for more good news. Enjoy previous episodes by downloading our podcast at growingingrace.ca. 
You can also visit HopeFellowshipYCC.com to find our service times and location. If this show has been an encouragement to you, please consider making a donation today at GrowingInGrace.ca and help us keep spreading this good news. Thank you again for tuning in to Still Growing in Grace.